Today's ARCA 200 on MRN Radio is sponsored by TransSouth, home of the Dash for Cash Racing Contest. TransSouth, for the right loan, right now. By Unical, the winning spirit rides with you every time. It's the spirit of 76. By Gatorade Thirst Quencher, Gatorade for that deep down body thirst. And by Planners Nuts. If you're a racing nut, eat Planners. They're nuts too. Welcome back to Daytona International Speedway as the ARCA 200 for the Automobile Racing Club of America is about set to unfold. There have been a number of drivers who have reached prominence in Winston Cup competition who began their racing career in the ARCA circuit. For instance, Benny Parsons won this ARCA 200 at Daytona back in 1969. Veteran Ramos Stott won in 1970. Jim Sauter, Kyle Petty, the late Tim Richmond, Joe Rutman, Rick Wilson, Mickey Gibbs, they have all won the ARCA 200 here at Daytona before reaching prominence in Bush Grand National and Winston Cup competition. So this is quite a stepping stone for some and for others, like veterans Dorsey Schrader and Red Farmer, it's not a stepping stone at all. It's just another day with a race being run and they're going to go out there and run it. MRN Radio with our coverage of Speed Weeks 1991. One man who might well be the busiest of any driver here at Daytona Beach, Florida all week is Dorsey Schrader, young driver from Baldwin, Missouri, who runs the ARCA race. He's running Winston Cup. He's running Bush Grand National. He's even in the International Race of Champions that debuts here this coming Friday. He is down on the trackside area right now awaiting driver introductions, and Winston Kelly is with him. Winston? Dorsey, as Eli Gold was telling the, the listening audience, a busy man this week. The moment at hand, though, the ARCA 200. Now, you're making a bit of a transition, normally driving the IMSA GTO and the SCCA Trans Am Series, going to the heavier cars. Starting on the pole, that transition seems to be going pretty well for you. Yeah, I'm real happy. You know, the Valvoline Napa Ford is, uh, is a real good race car, and the crew's done a good job of setting it up. I'm comfortable here on the oval with the car, and, you know, with a little bit of luck, we stay out of trouble today. I think we're going to do real well. Now, Dorsey, when we talk to most drivers who make the transition to the heavier cars and we talk about the differences, that gets most of the attention, the weight of the cars. What other differences are major in making this transition from your standpoint? It's really not the weight of the car all that much. It's the oval itself that's different. You know, on a road racing course, there's a pre-designated fast line, and the line around the racetrack stays the same no matter what, unless somebody blows an engine in front of you or something on it. The fast way around's the same. Here on the oval, it changes. You know, sometimes you got to run low, sometimes you got to run high, and uh, the premium is set up on the car setup. You know, the driver himself, he's not the determining factor here. It's, it's the car, the engine, the aerodynamics. It's all the whole the package that does the thing here. How about your strategy for today's race? Well, Red Farmer's right behind me in the team car, so we're hoping to hook up in a draft and get away right away and r run out and uh, hopefully get away with the rest of the guys. If that doesn't happen, I'll probably fall into a conservative role and uh, maybe not be the guy to lead, but I just sit around here and let Red teach me some. I know he's got a lot of tricks. Dorsey Schrader starts his Ford Thunderbird on the inside of row number one in this afternoon's ARCA 200. We should establish, Barney, that Dorsey Schrader is not a relative of Ken Schrader. They spell their last name differently, and even though they are both Missouri drivers, uh, there is no relationship there between uh, Kenny and Dorsey Schrader, other than they're both champion drivers. Last year, Jimmy Horton had great success on most of the super speedways running in the ARCA division. Let's get his thoughts. Jim Phillips? Well, as a matter of fact, Barney was king of the super speedways last year in this division. Five super speedway wins. This started right here at Daytona, but this year a different look. Last year it was a Pontiac, Natchez Chevrolet, and this year a V6 engine instead of a V8. Why, Jimmy? Well, we just, you know, Jim Ruggles and I talked about it, and, you know, he just thinks that the V6 is a little bit better on a horsepower range, and, you know, maybe we'll get a little bit more life on our tires and gas mileage. Maybe we can win the race doing that. So it's, it's strategy. Since we are going to use the new NASCAR pit rule for this race today, and it will be the first time in 1991, does your team plan to run the entire 200 miles in the same set of tires? Yeah, I don't think we plan on changing unless something goes wrong. We run over something. And I think we can make it. We made it on, at Talladega. We are just changing right sides, and we didn't really have to. So, uh, you know, I think we can make it. We're pretty confident on the Hoosier tires. You're in the company of a couple of strong Fords, Dorsey Schrader and Red Farmer, your strategy. Well, I'm just, we just got to size each other up, you know, just kind of hang on and just ride along for a little while. You know, I don't really like leading them too much. And, you know, if I can sit back and follow them the whole race and coming off the board for a checker, 
beat him. That's what I want to do. That's Jimmy Horton, and that's exactly what he did last year. He didn't lead all the races all the time, but it would come time to get the checker flag. He was the man out front. Charlie Glossback has been around as, as long as I have, and he's never changed his driving style. He runs just as hard as he can run every lap. Dick Brooks is with him. Well, we sure are, and he walks just like he used to, too, just kind of nonchalantly walking off across the infield here. <laughs> Charlie, we've been around this thing a long, long time, and I used to enjoy watching you race, and, and I used to enjoy racing with you, and uh, here you're still doing it, and you still say you're enjoying it, and you ain't working, you're just uh, playing. Yeah, Dick, you know, uh, I pedal around home a little bit and uh, run a few of these races and have a little fun. It's, it's fun now. You know, before it was kind of work, but... Uh, you know, we go out here and with a good car and run good in these ARCA races, so it's really enjoyable. You had a good season last year. I don't know for sure how many you ran, but you won a couple of them. Yeah, we ran uh, six times, and I think we had a fourth and a couple of seconds and a couple of wins and a third. So, you know, if we can just do that this year, I'd say, you know, we'll be real lucky. Charlie, you used to really like Darlington. I used to like to watch you run there, and, uh, and you liked Talladega and Daytona. Is it still as much fun as it was? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, I think it's more fun now than it used to be. Yeah, you don't have the pressure, huh? Yeah, that's right. There's no pressure at all. You know, they tell me go out there and do the best I can do, and that's what I do. Well, guys, I'll bet you that uh, he means that from the bottom of his heart because Charlie Gotts backs a race driver from a long, long time ago, and he still is, still enjoys it. I enjoy watching him. We were talking with some guys who say that when Charlie's out there running three abreast at 200 miles an hour and he will just be as cool and calm on the two-way radio as though he were sitting in his easy chair at home and that's uh, the kind of demeanor you need when you uh, get yourself into a uh, Winston Cup or in this case Arca stock car. Another guy who was used to that kind of competition and has won better than 725 feature races over the year is a man who was both a crew chief and now today a driver again, Charles Red Farmer of Hueytown, Alabama. Let's get his thoughts as he gets set to go. And Eli, we're walking along beside the man they affectionately call the Redhead, won his first race in 1949. Back on the super speedway in the last few years, Red. How about today's race? Well, I feel real good about it. The car's working real good. Uh, the engine, they tuned it up this morning. If we can get another couple miles an hour out of it, I think we'll be real good shape. I don't think I can be as awesome as Earnhardt is, but, you know, it's a long race. I just hope we have a good, safe race. And uh, I think if the car works to my performance, I've got a real good feeling the car's going to be right up in front when the race is over. Red Dorsey Schrader was telling us that he hoped to hook up with you and you two pull away. You think you can do that? Well, we'll just have to see it. You know, you can make all kinds of plans, but when they drop the green flag and we go down that back straightaway, we have to pretty well make plans as we go along. I mean, that's the way I apply to do it. I said, if we can work with Dorsey, I'm going to do it. If the two boards can hook up and pull away, that's what we want to try to do. If one of us is not working good and the car's wiggling in the traffic or in the draft, I may have to pick an Oldsmobile Chevy to go with. But, you know, we're going to try to work together. You don't need to work by yourself out there. Uh, if you do with us plates, you just go nowhere. So you've got to get a racing buddy to go with and then hope you can run with him all day. With the new pit road rules that we're going to be using today, what's your pit strategy? Well, uh, our pit strategy right now, we're on the Hoosier tires, and I think the Hoosier tires can go the whole distance without a pit stop. So if everything works out, we're going to try to, try to make a caution green, a gas stop, and that's all. Well, good luck this afternoon. Thank you. Red Farmer, he's notched 725 wins in his illustrious career. He goes off third this afternoon. He made a good point. They were talking about the pit rules. This will be the first chance that we'll have to see NASCAR's new pit rules go into effect. Now, the ARCA people elected to try them also to make pit road much safer for their type of racing, just the same as NASCAR. So we're going to get the first look this afternoon at how things work uh, as far as that goes. Now, that new pit rule, again, for those who might not be familiar, is uh, it's really simpler than it sounds, to be honest with you. Under caution, you can come down the pit road. You cannot change tires. You can fill up with fuel. You can do anything you'd like from the left side of the automobile. Obviously, the intent there is to keep folks away from in front of and to the right side of uh, the cars on pit road. Then when we go back to green flag racing, on the very first lap of green, everybody stays on the racetrack. Nobody can pit. On the second lap of green flag racing, those cars who are pitted in the odd-numbered pit stalls will pit first. Then on the third lap of green flag racing, those cars in the even-numbered pit stalls will be able to come down the pit lane. 
And uh, that is the basic story behind the rules. There are a few more intricacies that we'll explain as the afternoon unfolds. But the bottom line were those particulars that we've just given you. And it's interesting, again, to point out that some who figure that they can go just on fuel stops and not worry about tires will be able to make their stop under caution and not have to worry at all about stopping under green. And Jim Phillips, you and I were talking with a few of the other drivers this morning, and there are some who feel they can even go 300 miles without changing tires, as the Bush Grand National cars are going to be looking at doing come Saturday. That's right, Eli, 3,200-pound race cars on this speedway. And I know in the past, when they were 3,450, there were some cars that went the distance of the bias ply tires for 300 miles. And I feel like uh, the 3,200-pound cars, of course, these cars weigh 3,400 pounds, the ARCA cars. But, of course, uh, the tires are maybe a little bit better than they were three or four or five years ago. So I think that uh, we'll see uh, quite a few drivers go the distance today and in the Goodies 300 because with this restrictor plate, that uh, position on the racetrack is so important. Today's broadcast of the Bush Clash and the ARCA 200 is brought to you under exclusive radio rights granted by the Daytona International Speedway to MRN Radio solely for the private, non-commercial use of our listening audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of the description and accounts of this race without the expressed written consent of NASCAR, ARCA, and MRN Radio is prohibited. And now the field of 42 is assembled on pit road for the start of this 80-lap ARCA 200. Let's meet the starting lineup. 42nd starting spot getting in on a provisional start is Graham Taylor from Port Royal, Pennsylvania, the car mate trailers Ford. Another provisional starter is Dave Weltmeyer of Hazelcrest, Illinois, in the Atlas Copco Tools Chevrolet. 40th starter is Ron Burchett, just getting back after changing an engine earlier today. Ron Burchett, Jr. from Walkertown, North Carolina, in the Pilot Engines Chevrolet. 39th is David Boggs of Wake Forest, North Carolina, the Finney Racing Oldsmobile. 38th is Roy Payne. He's running for Rookie of the Year in ARCA this year. He's from Hueytown, Alabama, in the Mopar Performance Chrysler. 37th is John Stratman, Jr. from Cleveland, Ohio, his own Oldsmobile. 36th starter is Jerry Hill from Brandywine, Maryland, driving his own Buick. One of only two V6 powered cars in the field is starting in 35th spot. That's Rusty Johnson from Fultondale, Alabama. He's driving the Jody's Place Chevrolet. 34th is a former ARCA Series champion, Bob Dotter from Chicago, Illinois, the D&D Racing Chevrolet. Billy Simmons from Opelika, Alabama, has the SNS Racing Chevrolet in 33rd. 32nd is is Doc Watson from Ormond Beach, Florida. A former boxer, used to be a sparring partner for Joe Frazier, among others. Doc Watson in the Dixie Queen Riverboat Chevrolet. And 31st starter is Glenn Brewer from Columbus, Georgia. In the Eagle Budweiser Oldsmobile, he is the brother of Winston Cup crew chief Tim Brewer. 30th spot belongs to rookie driver Jerry Cook of Sylvania, Ohio, the Target Expediting Oldsmobile. 29th in making a return to ARCA Racing after a little over a year being away for a maternity leave, Patty Simcoe Schacht of Lexington, South Carolina, the Bob Schacht Motorsports Racing Buick. 28th starter, Ken Reagan of Unadilla, Georgia, the Ken Cade Racing Chevrolet. 27th, and boy, he's got a sponsor I love, Bobby Woods of Pahrump, Nevada, in the Screaming Squeegees Oldsmobile. We'll talk a little bit about that later this afternoon. 26th starter, Joe Nimrowski of Suffield, Connecticut, in the Boardwalk Auto Sales Oldsmobile. Chris Gerke will be starting 25th from Lincoln, Illinois, in the Lean Supreme Oldsmobile. 24th starter from Daytona Beach, Florida, and he had a great finish here back in February last year, finished second. He is uh, in the Gibson Racing Oldsmobile. Let's see if we can get his thoughts. We're with Mark Gibson, Barney, and I remember talking to him after last year's ARCA 200. He was probably about as happy as Jimmy Horton was, but you just told me you want to do one better today. Uh, we'd like to do one better. You know, it's, it was great running second last year, but the, the, the hard part of that, we have to come back and show it wasn't a fluke that we ran that way. We got the car running a lot better in the last practice yesterday. We got up to around 188, 189. So if we can just catch the draft, I think we'll be all right. So the draft is the key for you this afternoon? Yeah, it really is. Uh, starting this far back, you, you, it's hard to run by yourself and break away. So uh, we're just going to try to catch up maybe with Charlie and follow him to the front and then see what happens the last 10 or uh, 5, 10 laps. The 1986 Rookie of the Year of this division, Mark Gibson starts 24th in his Oldsmobile. He hopes to have a good run today. 23rd starter, a rookie driver, Tim Hepler from Statesville, North Carolina, the Hepler Racing Chrysler. 22nd, Donnie Moran of Frazeesburg, Ohio, the Alpine Alpa Cheese Chrysler, and he should have a good run here today also. Charlie Glotzbach, we heard from a moment ago, the Indiana driver in the Garrett Trucking Chevrolet. Starting in the 20th spot, the defending ARCA Permatech Series champion, 
Bob Brevac from Ashland, Wisconsin, has his race glazed Buick in 20th spot. Jim Phillips is standing alongside that blue and yellow machine. Well, today, Bob Brevac, you start defense of your 1990 ARCA title. Different pit rules, different tire combinations. What's your strategy for today? Well, we're here and we're ready, and uh, we're just going to do the best we can and give them a run for it, try and get by the first half of the race and see all the cards are laying and see what we got, see what everybody else has got, and give them heck from the rest of the way out. How about this Buick machine in the draft? Well, the race glazed Buick uh, is, is a good car in the draft. It uh, loses a little by itself. But if we can get the thing in the proper draft with the right cars, I think we can be competitive. That's Bob Reback, the 1990 ARCA champion. And these cars are 62 and a half inches wide compared to a Winston Cup car, which is 60.5. So handle a little bit better in the corners. Starting in the 19th spot is Carl Muscotten Jr. He is the father of Carl Muscotten III, who has run a good bit on the ARCA series over the last few years. Uh, Muscotten is from Fort Wayne, Indiana, in the Anglo-American Auto Auction Buick. 18th is Mark Thompson from Cartersville, Georgia. He's driving Henley Gray's Chevrolet. 17th is Bob Keselowski, a former ARCA champion from Rochester Hills, Michigan, the K Automotive Chevrolet. 16th is Mike Davis from Camden, Arkansas. He's driving the second Bob Schacht entered car. It's an Oldsmobile. Fifteenth is Dale McDowell from Chickamauga, Georgia, the Dover Cylinder Heads Chevrolet. Fourteenth is Billy Thomas from Phoenix City, Alabama, his own Pontiac. Thirteenth starter, another Rookie of the Year campaigner for ARCA, Keith Wade from Quinton, Alabama, the Tarrant Hydraulic Services Buick. In twelfth, Bobby Gerhardt, the veteran from Lebanon, Pennsylvania in the Thomas Chevrolet. And eleventh is David Simcoe from Clarkston, Michigan, the Mound Steel Oldsmobile. Quick look at the the top 10 in 10th position, Cecil Eunice of Blackshear, Georgia, in the 11 Racing Oldsmobile. Starting 9th, Scott Hansen of Green Bay, Wisconsin, the Air Orlando Chevrolet. Starting 8th, Farrell Harris of Pikeville, Kentucky, the Old Coal Miner, the T.T. Coley Racing Pontiac. 7th starter, Bobby Bowser of Springfield, Ohio, the Don Thompson Excavating Ford. Starting 6th is Kerry Teague. He's a youngster we'll keep our eye on here this afternoon from Concord, North Carolina, in the Salder Seal New Power Oldsmobile. 5th starter, Bill Venturini of Chicago, Illinois in the Amico Ultimate Chevrolet. Starting fourth, Ben Hess of Wadsworth, Ohio, the Salem Leasing Oldsmobile. Third starter we heard from a moment ago, Red Farmer from Hueytown, Alabama, the Napa Auto Parts Ford. And on the front row in the number two spot is Jimmy Horton from Folsom, New Jersey. He's driving the B6 we talked about. We'll keep you posted on that. Miles Concrete Chevrolet and on the pole, Dorsey Schrader from Baldwin, Missouri and the Napa Auto Parts Racing Ford. Should be a, quite a classy field here. The equipment gets better and better. And with the experience they've had on the super speedways, used to this was probably the only super speedway they ran, except maybe Talladega once in a while they'd go there. Now they run Atlanta and they run here and they run Talladega and they have really developed some good driving styles, most of these ARCA drivers. Of course, last year the addition of Michigan for the very first time and what was an experiment and turned out to be an outstanding race and back they go again to the Irish Hills this year so uh, Arca is really establishing themselves as quite a force in what used to be a Midwest series that now has very much of a national scope. The season opener for the Arca Permatech Supercar Series, the Arca 200, that is 80 laps, 200 miles here on the high banks. Two pace cars now in front of the field, and that, of course, is what we'll be seeing during events on the NASCAR Winston Cup season throughout uh, 1991. Those two pace cars, one that will eventually stay on the racetrack and one to lead the cars down the uh, pit lane under caution. Elmo Langley driving one car and veteran Ramo Stott driving the other. Here today, we have already seen Dale Earnhardt dominate to win the Bush Clash, and many of the fine moves that Dale pulled off today happened in turns one and two, where his car handled so very beautifully. Joe Moore from WPEX Radio in Hampton, Virginia, is positioned there. Eli, we've got a good watch from over here in turn number two. I'm on a platform about 30 feet up in the air just at the exit of turn number two, and I'll be following the action of the ARCA 200 today as the cars hit the end of the front stretch and climb the 31-degree banking. Now, the racetrack is plenty wide. You could actually put three cars side by side easily but at 190 miles an hour all of a sudden it gets mighty narrow looking when you go into turn one and it looks like uh, you can barely get one car in there in the single file formation but we'll be seeing quite a bit of bouncing around as the cars come through here and of course the most important thing that happens in turn one and two is getting set for your charge down the back straight away where all the drafting takes place and with this long field of cars getting set to go that's going to be a key factor 
They sweep out of turn number two, go down that long back straightaway and up into turn number three, and a lot of critical maneuvering goes on over there. Alan Bestwick from Daytona Beach, Florida. Well, Barney, the maneuvering that's going on over here is where you either make it or break it. You either make the pass and get back up in a line in front of someone, or you fail to make the pass, and about 20 cars or so go by you before you can get back in a line. Drafting here is... The, the most critical factor in coming through the back straightaway of the Daytona International Speedway. 3,000 feet long, ever so slightly banked, making the way up into turn number three and four where you must have that pass completed or you're not going to make it. In turns three and four of Daytona International Speedway is Fred Armstrong, having just flown in from Portland, Oregon, where he became a new daddy just the other day. Fred, congratulations. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much. And hi to all back, all my folks back in Portland, Oregon. We're about 30 feet up uh, on the outside of the exit of turn four. A lot of action here so far today uh, in the Bush Clash. Some of the cars coming together and setting off those big chain reactions. The same thing we saw last year here in the ARCA 200. A couple of big wrecks, and it all happened down here in turn number four. This turn has been called many, many things by the drivers. I think the best name for it is Calamity Corner. After you come off turn four, that's where you can set up the draft again for that final charge down to the start-finish line. And here the field comes two by two, 42 cars strong off turn number four. The lights are off atop the blue Pontiac Grand Prix GTP. Elmo Langley pulls it to the left, down pit road he goes, and we look for the green flag atop the flag stand as Dorsey Schrader leads them to the line. Down they come, Schrader on the break will get away, tuck it out single file by himself. Scramble's gonna be going on from fourth position on back as they shuffle, heading into turn number one for the start of the ARCA 200. Schrader gets the lead, his Ford out in front of the field while Red Farmer now goes to the inside of Jimmy Horton's V6 powered Chevrolet. Farmer's trying to get up there with Schrader and form that draft, but so far, Farmer can't get by Horton. He's working on the outside. Ben Hess sits behind those two. Battle is still side by side for the second position as they come down the back straightaway for the first time begin to shuffle it out single file still for second spot red farmer to the inside jimmy horton to the outside then ben hess and kerry t red farmer takes it right down to the bottom of the racetrack ben hess will follow along now jimmy horton pretty much hung out to dry on the high side two by two for second as they come off turn four jimmy horton had tried to sneak in behind dorsey schrader and break up the idea that red farmer had of tucking in behind dorsey and seeing those two thunderbirds pull away from that gaggle of chevrolets near the front it's not working but another man on the Move, trying to swing out to the inside is Ben Hess. He'll make it three wide for second. Hess goes down on the inside of the racetrack, just like Earnhardt did in the Bush Clash, but it's not going to work here in turn number two. His car drifts up the banking, so again, he falls in behind Red Farmer and Jimmy Horton. Still that side-by-side -side battle for the second spot as they come down the back straightaway. They're halfway down the stretch. It's Farmer to the inside and Horton to the outside. Ford and Chevrolet, still Ben Hess, tucked in line in fourth. Ben Hess will take it down to the bottom of the racetrack. That may help out Red Farmer. Now Hess drifts up the banking a bit. Horton still stuck on the outside. Dorsey Schrader begins to break away as they come off turn four. Schrader has all the clean air out front all by himself. The scramble is from second on back door to door for second, third, and fourth. As they work across the line, Schrader is the leader. Red Farmer having a lot of heat put on by Jimmy Horton. As they work back into turn number one, Ben Hess looks like he wants to make a move. Horton just will not give any room there. He holds his line on the outside of the racetrack. Red Farmer battles away down Low. Those two cars drift high. Ben Hess now looks to the inside. Directly behind him, Kerry Teague. And Bill Venturini now goes to the outside of Teague. And the interesting thing about this is that while they battle side by side for second, the leader, Dorsey Schrader, has not been able to get away. He's only opened up about three car lengths now. And still, Farmer and Horton are side by side. Up high in the banking goes Horton. Down low is Red Farmer. Right behind is Ben Hess in the Bill Venturini car. And now Schrader begins to break away just a bit as they come off turn four. Midway in the field with a brand new key. Keith Dorton and Jim Charlie Glotzbach, who started 21st, is running 20th, so he's picked up one position in the first three laps of the ARCA 200. Second place, you've got a pretty good battle underway. Jimmy Horton is there. You've got Ben Hess working to the inside of Bill Venturini. Kerry Teague also trying to work himself up near the front as cars Turtle go high. Turn four. Two cars go into the wall, make it three now. One of them is Red Farmer. The other one is Bill Venturini. They just ride the wall gently now as the caution flag came out. All three cars got up way high in the banking. They got caught up in each other nose to tail and bumper to bumper. They just kind of 
ease their way right up to the top of the banking. They got into the wall, and nobody got out of shape. It was just an amazing job of driving by those three drivers. Give a lot of credit to the ARCA drivers, Eli. Nobody locked it down this time. Nobody panicked. They kept the cars in a straight line. Red Farmer's car easing along here in the front straightaway. Bill Venturini is out against that wall, and it's scrubbed all the way down for perhaps 1,000 feet, but it doesn't appear to be that damaged. Just uh, quite a bit of paint scrubbed off the car, and we are under caution for the first time. One factor we have here is that the drivers involved most prominently were Farrell Harris, the uh, coal miner from Pikeville, Kentucky, who has a good bit of smoke streaming from behind his car, but he's a veteran, Red Farmer and Bill Venturini, so uh, if something like that was going to happen involving three drivers, it happened with three of the more veteran campaigners on the Arca circuit. They have run here and at Talladega and Atlanta so many times, they knew exactly how to handle things, but for Red Farmer, no disappointment there as he was harboring thoughts of his 726th career win this afternoon. Bill Venturini's car, Farrell Harris, and Red Farmer all in the pits. Let's go to pit road. Dick Brooks? Well, I'm in uh, Bill Venturini's pits, and they, uh, I was trying to find out where all the dust was. The car is, is, uh, looked like it's been through the desert out there. Uh, he got a bit of damage on the right-hand side, all right, and I guess it's just concrete dust coming off the wall, but uh, they've got a couple guys in there trying to clean it out. Never seen anything quite like that, but uh, <laughs> anyway, they're going to try to get him back in the race. He's still sitting in the car. They're beating the sheet metal around on it, fixing the tires, and uh, he'll probably go back in if they get it to where he can see out. All the sand and dirt at Daytona after they run a race will go right out against that outside wall, and that's where Venturini rode the wall for perhaps a couple of thousand feet. Jim Phillips? We're caught up with the coal miner, Farrell Harris. Farrell, what happened? Red Farmer was losing it in every end, and as long as he drove, I don't know why he wouldn't slow down. He finally spun out in front of Bill Carini, and I, I just got in the wall trying to get by both of them. Do you think you can get your car fixed and get back in the race? No, we come down here to win. A lap down here, it's all over for you. That's Farrell Harris. He's out of it this afternoon. Meanwhile, Red Farmer is pulled back onto the racetrack. Winston Kelly? The damage on Red Farmer's car is very similar to that of Bill Venturini. It's primarily concentrated on the right side. When he came into the pits, the right front tire was completely shredded and came off as he rolled onto pit road. Davy Allison's crew, led by Robert Yates, primarily providing the service to Red Farmer. They had to beat the sheet metal out from the right front of the tire as well on this end of pit road. So Red Farmer did lose a lap before he returned to the action. Red is using a Robert Yates engine with a, an Allison carburetor and, uh, under the hood of car number 74. Again, only two V6-powered machines out there today, Jimmy Horton being one and Rusty Johnson being the other. There are some substantial uh, number differences on weight and so on between V6 and V8-powered cars. V6 is at 3,250 pounds, the V8 at 3,400 pounds. We'll tell you more as our afternoon continues, but right now Elmo Langley pulling the Pontiac down pit road. We're going back to green. Green flag is in the air. Single file restart. They won't stay single file very long as Kerry Teague drops down to the inside of Ben Hess here at the start finish line. Tried to pick up a position real quick. It won't work. And now he's hung out there all by himself as they head back to turn one. Teague will lose two more spots. Bobby Bowser is able to get by on the outside. Now Cecil Eunice pulls up on the outside of Kerry Teague. But now Teague begins to battle back. This will be the battle for third. Up front, though, it's Dorsey Schrader leading the way. Horton sits in the second spot. Ben Hess is third and Bobby Bowser fourth. They run it out single file now among the front five as they come down the back straightaway. The first battle will be back now for the fifth position. On the outside is Cecil Eunice. He has the fifth spot for the moment, but Kerry Teague is going to try and come back on the inside and regain that spot. Kerry Teague will get the spot. Meanwhile, up front, the top four begin to pack together, and it's going to be Jimmy Horton looking at the inside of Dorsey Schrader as they come off turn four. Kerry Teague got an awfully good jump on the restart that time. One of the keys to picking up that position there as Schrader leads. Ben Hess will sweep to the inside of Jimmy Horton here at the stripe trying to grab second. Hess's black car inside of the white machine of Jimmy Horton still battling for second. Horton still got the nose out in front though in the outside lane but Hess is battling with him right down at the inside of the track in turn two. Now it's the nose of Hess's car that's out in front off turn number two but Horton's still there. Front four have broken away from fifth on back by a good distance now about a thousand feet of racetrack as they come to the end of the back straightaway. Sorted out it'll be Jimmy Horton that holds on to second. Ben Hess will fall back in line into third. Ben Hess drifting back just a little bit. 
Horton about two car lengths in front. Now Horton begins to gain just a bit on Dorsey Schrader. The front four, single file down to the bottom of the racetrack. One car way off the pace going through turns one and two and is now down on the apron of the racetrack. Billy Thomas will be heading for pit road. Meanwhile, the battle for the lead comes back to the start finish line. Dorsey Schrader hangs on to it. Jimmy Horton gets real close. Three cars up there locked nose to tail back in turn one. Schrader by a car length over Jimmy Horton and directly behind him right on his bumper, the Ben Hess car. Then it's about five car lengths back to the Bobby Bowser machine. Those front three McCar cars lead the way off turn two. Then Bowser, ten car lengths back. Bob Prevac is in the wall in turn two. His car shot up the banking, slid down to the inside. Everyone's able to get by. A lot of smoke, though, out of Bob Brevac's car in turn two. Caution is on the speedway. It'll be the second one of the afternoon as Bob Brevac had trouble over in turns one and two. The car went up and came right down through traffic. And again, I'm going to commend the ARCA drivers. Nobody locked it down. The car spun right through the middle of seven or eight machines. Everybody kept it in a straight line. Let's go back to turn two. A lot of heads up driving. Barney, you're right as the rest of that pack of cars came through. Brevac's car was on the outside lane coming into turn number one. And the defending ARCA Series champ's car just seemed to shoot out from underneath him, slammed into the outside wall, spun around once, and then slid down on the apron where it now sits. Again, everyone else was able to get by. Brevac's car still sits at the inside of the racetrack. Safety crews are overtending to the car now. Kerry Teague is on pit road. We were talking about the great jump he got before on that last restart. It uh, turns out to be a bit too good of a jump as the young driver from Concord, North Carolina, has been brought in by uh, NASCAR for a stop and go penalty. He has now rejoined the field as we are under caution. Red Farmer has been back on pit road. He came in as the cars took the restart moments ago, and they're working under the hood of that lucky Compton-owned machine. And so far, Lucky's been kind of lucky with one of his cars leading the ARCA 200. But the other Compton car has been on uh, the pit road for much of the day. And quite a bit of damage to Red's car. They will be very lucky just to get him back in there and salvage some kind of a finish this afternoon. Ten laps are complete. Dorsey Schrader leads. Jimmy Horton is second and Ben Hess is third in the ARCA 200. Second caution of the afternoon comes out early here at Daytona in the ARCA 200 when Bob Brevac spun and hit the wall over in turn number two just a moment ago. Only one car was showing behind the wall, Farrell Harris, who suffered some damage a little bit earlier. From the Daytona International Speedway, this is MRN Radio. The ARCA 200 under caution for the second time this afternoon here at Daytona on lap number 11. Red Farmer has just taken his car to the garage area after the uh, lap number four incident between himself, Bill Venturini, and Farrell Harris. Meanwhile, this caution because of Bob Brevac tagging the turn two wall. Let's get an update from Joe Moore. Oh, Bob seemed to be okay. Eli stepped out of his car here in turn number two, surveyed the damage, and walked under his own power over to get into the ambulance for the mandatory checkup. They had to bring the row back out to put his car up. A lot of extensive damage on the left side of the car, but they have now loaded the car up and are now driving away. Still working caution. A couple of cars are on pit road. Billy Thomas's machine down there being attended to. 12 laps of racing. And again, I, I don't think we can say enough about what we have seen in the two cautions that have come out with accidents off turn four and accident over in the middle of turns one and two. The composure and the professionalism that we've seen in the ARCA drivers here. So a couple of years ago, these guys would come down here with not that much super speedway experience. And it's like anybody said, anybody of the Winston Cup guys or ARCA drivers will tell you that do have years and years on a super speedway. As long as you're out there by yourself when you come here the first time, it seems fairly easy to run 180 to 190 miles an hour. And I guess it is the way these cars are set up. But they say that during competition, when something goes wrong and you suddenly realize, hey, this thing's going sideways or whatever, or there's somebody spinning in front of me, that you realize how fast you're going. And that's where the problems happen. It takes a while, I guess, to just keep your composure composure when you see a car spin in front of you or something like that. But today, they've done a whale of a job. They really have. I asked Donnie Moran about that. He's a veteran dirt driver now in the Arca circuit. I said, you seem to be really comfortable on the big tracks. Oh, yeah. You know, like I've raced dirt racing for 12 years, and I've been running Daytona, Talladega, and Atlanta, and went to Michigan the, once. And uh, the more I go, the more comfortable I get. And I'm getting more comfortable in the draft and around cars and more knowing what it's going to do when I'm out there. Compared to, like, the first time I was out there, I didn't know what was going to go on. And that's what the experience means in any kind of racing. Let's check in with Winston Kelly in the garage. Eli Red Farmer is still sitting in his car talking to his crew, and you can tell that he hit the, car, hit the wall very hard, flush against the wall. The, the damage to the right side of the car is completely even all the way down the right side of the wall, which generally means 
that the uh, the hit was awful tough. He's indicating that he's got a little bit of pain in his chest, so they're going going to take him to the infield care center and check him over, and we'll try to get a comment with him later. But Red Farmer out of this afternoon's race. Mike Davis also spent some time in the pits. His car has just come off pit road and is on the apron of the racetrack, not coming up to speed. We'll find out if he's waiting for the rest of the field to come on by, but he is very slow going on, down into the number one corner. It'll be a single file restart. They get the indication this time as the pace car takes him back toward turn number one. We'll go back to green here in just a moment. Now we're showing four cars behind the wall. Rusty Johnson just took his car out behind the wall a moment ago, but they're still working on it back there. They haven't taken it back to the garage area. Red Farmer is out, Bob Brevac and Farrell Harris. And now uh, we see the field in the uh, corner of turn one, but the lights have come back on atop the safety car. At least it looks that way from our vantage point. Joe Moore? No, I believe the lights are still off, Eli. It looks like the, the field may be forming up for the restart as the safety cars lead them. They're all in single file. Looks like they would be going to the double-wide formation if they were about ready to get the restart. But Dorsey Schrader leads the field, and one of the safety cars is peeling off here in turn two. Must have been the glint of some of the Florida sunshine off the uh, lights atop the safety car. Quick reminder about some of the broadcasts, some of the special broadcasts you'll be hearing and seeing from Daytona this week. On Thursday evening, let's start in uh, correct order, Tuesday night, NASCAR Live is on the air. Richard Petty will be along, as will Harry Melling. Richard, of course, the uh, seven-time Winston Cup champion. Harry Melling, the car owner for Bill Elliott's Ford Thunderbird. That's Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern. Thursday evening, a special edition of NASCAR Live, which Alan Bestwick will be hosting. He'll have Jeff Bodine and Tim Brewer, Benny Parsons, among others. That will be from 7 until 8 o'clock, just across the street from the Speedway at the Volusia Mall. That same evening at 7.30, our television show this week in NASCAR will be on from the Howard Johnson's Hotel here in Daytona. That used to be the Clarendon Plaza. Richard Petty will be our guest on the TV side, along with uh, some other special invitees. Now, that's coming up Thursday, uh, radio at 7, television at 7.30 on a busy, busy Speed Weeks 1991. Well, things do really get busy this final week. The green flag is in the air, and the ARCA 200 will go back to competitive speed as they head off into turn number one. Dorsey Schrader is the leader. Right behind him, Jimmy Horton rides in the number two spot. Ben Hess is third, and fourth is Bobby Bowser. Battle for the lead in turn one. They'll go to the inside of the racetrack. That's a Dorsey Schrader car. Holds his line as Jimmy Horton tries to climb the banking. He'll try to pull up on the outside, but that won't work. Meanwhile, a good battle back for fifth as well. Cecil Eunice is shuffled to the outside. One car comes to the inside. That's the Bob Keselowski car off turn two. Meanwhile, the lead cars are halfway down the back straightaway, and they've broken away from fifth on back by a good distance now. Still at the head of the pack, Dorsey Schrader. The battle continues to be from fifth and sixth on back as Carl Muscotten tries to work his way to the front. Good battle there as they come into the corner, but now Jimmy Horton wants to make a stab at it. He'll plant it right down to the bottom of the racetrack, but Dorsey Schrader defends the inside line coming off four. As they work back towards the trioval area, they will put lap number 15 of 80 on the board. Schrader, Horton. Ben Hess and Bobby Bowser, then back to David Simcoe, Bobby Gerhardt, Cecil Eunice, and Carl Miscotton. But those front cars, the front four, pull away now by better than two and a half, three seconds. Really starting to stretch it out, but they're beginning to shuffle up a little bit for themselves. Ben Hess drops to the inside of the racetrack, off turn two. He goes to work on Horton and now goes for the lead. Down to the inside, they'll make it three wide for the lead. Down to the inside, Hess will go all the way out in front. There'll be a three-way battle for second now. Down to the inside, Bowser will come by Dorsey Schrader, and he'll race with Jimmy Horton for the runner-up spot. Bowser down low, Horton up high. Bobby Bowser takes that left front tire, just plants it right down to the bottom of the racetrack. In front leading, it's Ben Hess off turn four. We are now working the 19th of 80 laps. The race lead is 2.06 seconds for Ben Hess back to fourth place. That's how tight they're running right now. Ben Hess, Bobby Bowser, Jimmy Horton, and then the pole sitter, Dorsey Schrader, back into the fourth spot. A span of 2.06 seconds between them. The second caution of the day came out when Bob Brevac of Ashland, Wisconsin, hit the wall in turn number two. He has just exited the care center. Winston Kelly is down there. Bob is obviously okay walking under his own power. And a tough way to start your title defense, Bob. What happened? Well, we have like trouble off turn number four as one car spins a couple, three times. David Simcoe is the car. He has yet to make contact with anything, but now he does with the inside retaining wall. And one other car spins up near Fred Armstrong. That's right, Eli. Just a moment ago, uh, one car began to spin to the outside of the racetrack. It was Jerry Cook in that black uh, car. 
black and white machine spun up, hit the outside retaining wall, came down to the inside of the racetrack. Things got a little bit hairy there for a Mormon as he started to drift back up the banking. A couple of other cars dove up high to avoid him. And uh, the black car sits now down to the inside of the racetrack. He is moving around inside the car, about 20 feet in front of us as we sit here on the outside of turn four. And the safety crews are on their way. Jerry Cook with a lot of damage to his car, sitting on the apron of the racetrack just out of turn number four. That happened just about 10 or 15 seconds after David Simcoe's car broke loose coming out of turn number four and slid some 15, 1,600 feet down through the, do the dog leg here at Daytona, ending up against that inside concrete retaining wall. So all of a sudden, cars are getting damaged right and left here at Daytona, and it seems to be the trouble spot coming out of turn number four. We're working lap 21, and this is the third caution flag of the day. Let's go back to Winston Kelly, who was talking with Bob Brevac at the time of those two incidents. Winston? Bob, you were telling us what happened out there in, for the second caution flag. Well, we were uh, we had the race clays Buick going along pretty good. And we were just biding our time, and it looks like we ran over something through the tri oval and got down to turn one, and the tire blew and slid it up through the bank and hit the wall, not real hard. And we did some quite a bit of body damage. I uh, hope the car's not hurt bad, but uh, you know we'll have the race clays Buick back in Atlanta and running good again. So the defending champion of this division is out this afternoon. David Simcoe, who spun that car just a moment ago, was having a good run. He was up in fifth position when the problem happened to him coming off turn number four. Now, Jerry Cook's car still is sitting out on the apron of the racetrack. Let's go back up to Fred Armstrong in turn four. The safety crew is just coming on the scene down here. Jerry Cook, we're taking a look right now through the glasses, is moving around inside of his car. A little difficult for him to get out as the steering column was pushed all the way up almost to the front of his helmet. But Jerry Cook just now beginning to disconnect himself from his machine as he sits still in his car. The safety crew is just coming on the scene right now to uh, hook up the tow truck also an ambulance on the scene right now it appears Jerry Cook moving around and conscious inside of his car so we are under caution for the third time this afternoon on lap number 21 next stop for the Arca Permatech supercar series will be the Atlanta Motor Speedway they go to Atlanta on the 16th of March that's the weekend of the Motorcraft 500 when the Winston Cup cars run there then on the 28th of April the Kill Care Speedway in Xenia Ohio playing host to the Arca series in May the Arca cars are at Talladega Super Speedway on May the 4th May the 25th at the Flat Rock Speedway in Flat Rock Michigan to Toledo Speedway in Toledo, Ohio hosts the ARCA cars the very next night. That's May the 26th. In June, it's up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin on the one-third mile clay oval there. That's on the 7th of June. The 15th at Pocono International Raceway, June the 15th. That's in conjunction with the Winston Cup weekend. Then on to Michigan International Speedway, June the 22nd for another weekend with the Winston Cup cars. So that's where the ARCA Permatech Series will be running in the next number of months. You might want to make your ticket plans right now. Let's Eli, go to Pit Road. Eli, uh, David Zemko just called out of his car. David, what happened? I had, I had a tire going down coming out of turn four. We come through the corner. We just is like an oil slick tire just come car just come around. You going to try to get it back together? No, nah, we broke the front tie rod, so we're done. Well, he's uh, sitting here with not much damage on the car. Just uh, scraped something a little bit, but all the tires are flat. Uh, Mark Gibson just come in just the lap before that happened and uh, checked his car over. And he's got an engine going sour, too. So some of these guys got some engine problem. Jim Phillips. Well, talk about engine problems. Charlie Glotzbach went behind the wall. It's his third engine this week in that uh, Floyd Garrett Chevrolet. He's behind the wall. Also, Ron Burchette, the uh, six-cylinder, one of the two in the race, he has lost a cylinder. And Jimmy Horton, as he went by just a moment ago, had some smoke trailing from his car, and it sounded as though that six-cylinder is down one. So a lot of engine problems early in the race here in the Permatex Arca Permatex 200. Jim, uh, uh, Billy Simpson is, is here also, and he's uh, out of his car, number 17 car. What happened to your car, Bill? We broke a gearbox. I had a vibration in the last three laps. I thought a tire would equalize. We come in to change right side tires and gearbox, and it broke when I was going out. Boy, it's terrible to come all this way and just run a, run a short time, right? Uh, it's hard. We had a bad year last year, but we get a new team together this year. We're going to be a competitor in the Arca Series. Well, it looks like they got a good-looking car, so try it again next year, I guess. Well, the Arca Division, a lot of them are not full-time racers. Maybe they run uh, half the schedule, or some of them run the entire schedule, but most of them have other employment, and they do it more or less as a hobby. And some of them have no serious aspirations to come Winston Cup, but a lot of them do. It's a good training ground. We are just about one half lap away from going back to green in a single file restart in the Arca 200. Ben Hess shows the way over Bobby Bauscher. 
Dorsey Schrader running in the third spot. Jimmy Horton is up in the fourth, and Colin Muscotten is showing in fifth. One driver who will not be seeing this restart on the racetrack is Charlie Glotzbach, retiring moments ago. Let's get the word from the garage. Charlie, after being so dominant in the 1990 season finale in Atlanta, had some problems this week at Daytona. What's the problem? Well, you know, uh, we burned a piston earlier in the week and didn't get to qualify uh, the first day, and so we got qualified yesterday and put another engine in for the race today. And uh, I don't know whether the ignition messed up on it or it just started missing real bad and didn't have no power, so uh, we had no choice but park it. Veteran Charlie Glotz back out of this afternoon's ARCA 200. Really hate to see him go to the garage here because, yeah. boy, he will put on a show. If he's got a car underneath him to get himself to the front, that's exactly where you'll find him. We've got a couple of cars that have pulled down out of line on this restart, and apparently they will be black flag. My understanding is on all these cautions that the restarts are single file. Indeed, until they have lapping on the racetrack, which we have not yet had. So the black flag flies as the green flag does. Doyle Ford waves the green at the entire field, and the backup flag man, Jim Clark of ARCA, waves the black flag at one of the slower cars on the inside of the racetrack. But we're back to green now, and the parade is back in at turn number one. Again, it's Ben Hess at the head of the pack with Bobby Bowser riding in the second spot. Dorsey Schrader is third, followed by Bobby Gearhart in fourth, and fifth is Carl Muscotten, all single file, off turn two and on the back stretch. Trouble in turn number one. One, one car, car has hit the wall. A car slides up the banking, now rolls back down to the inside of the racetrack. It's the blue-colored machine, John Stradman of Cleveland, Ohio. He rolls to the inside of the racetrack. Everyone else was able to get by. Caution is on the speedway. They don't get very much racing underway here before the yellow flag comes out again. And that car just broke loose back in the pack toward the tail end of the field, hit the outside wall, skittered down through some traffic, and has come to rest on the apron of the track. Joe Moore? Similar to what happened to Bob Brevac a little bit earlier here, the same spot in the speedway. The car just went up to the racetrack, hit the wall, but in the case of this particular driver, the car hit head first, and there's a lot of front-end damage to the car. Again, a good call to all the other ARCA drivers who got by without causing any problems. This was a one-car incident. The car now sits at the inside of the racetrack in turn two. So that'll give us a chance to catch up on some housekeeping here in the booth. The yellow fever really broken out here in the ARCA 200 in the early going this afternoon. 80 laps will comprise this race, and we've completed only 27. Mark Gibson has been in and out of the pit several times. They're now reporting his car to be five laps down. He had hoped to pull out a win here. Had a great run back here in February last year. The local driver from Daytona Beach, Florida, finished second in the ARCA 200 last year. But I don't think he's going to come to fruit for him this afternoon because he is five laps behind. And they're also showing Jimmy Horton, who we said a moment ago might have an engine problem, still running in 15th position. Let's see if uh, Dick Brooks has been able to track down any information about uh, the performance on Horton's car, Dick. Well, Billy Wilburn, I guess, is a crew chief over on uh, Horton's car. Uh, you different color uniform here. I had trouble running it down. But the car was having a little problem while ago. It seemed like he got it fixed now. Yeah, we... Um well, really no problem. We just want to stop and get some gas, make sure we can make it all the way. Uh, we're running a V6, a little bit different situation than most of the other cars run V8, so we just want to stop a little bit early and get some gas. What was the reason for running a V6 when everybody else was running the 8? Well, it, uh, there's a couple of advantages. You run a little bit bigger restrictor plate and uh, fuel mileage, weight. There's lots of advantages running a V6 right now. Well, these guys have done it before, and they've uh, been around a long time, so I'm sure they're playing all their cards. We were talking about some of the differences between the V6s and the V8s as far as the ARCA rule book is concerned. Uh, the V6 uh, cubic inch is 280 versus the 358 for the uh, V8-powered machines. The V6s use a 1 and 1 16th of the restrictor plate. The VH use a 15 16th of an inch uh, restrictor plate. The angle, though, on the rear spoiler is a minimum of 30. That's uh, regardless of uh, what you are using. So there are some uh, advantages, you would think, on paper for the V6. But uh, as Jimmy Horton laughed this morning, we mentioned it earlier, he said, you don't run on paper. He said, I understand that. He said, but on paper, he said, it should work to uh, use the V6 against all of these uh, eight-cylinder machines here at Daytona today. You know what's coming up in your area? The Winston Racing Series. Seems that we just talked about Max Prestwood Jr. winning the championship, and here is another season upon us. The NASCAR Winston Racing Series will be getting underway at racetracks all across America here over the next uh, month or so. Some of the outstanding short track racers will battle for the different regional championships and the NASCAR 
Winston Racing Series national title. If you'd like to find out about the NASCAR sanctioned track closest to you, you can write to the NASCAR Public Relations Office here in Daytona. Their address is Post Office Box 2875. Daytona Beach, Florida, and the zip is 32115, and those folks will be glad to send you the name, address, and the schedule of the Winston Racing Series track nearest to your home. John Stratman hit the wall up in turns one and two a moment ago to bring out this current caution flag, and Joe Moore, what's the situation over there? He's already climbed out of the car and got one of the safety vehicles. He's gone back to the garage area. They had to bring the row back up. Now they've loaded his car and is now taking it back to the garage area as well. Things are cleared up. We're just about ready to go back racing here in turn two. They're giving the field the indication, and one more lap they will go back to green let's give you the running order here as 29 30 laps have just come up on the scoreboard ben hess being posted as a leader bobby Boucher is second dorsey schrader is third bobby gerhardt runs fourth carl miscotton runs in fifth bob keselowski is sixth dale mcdowell seventh ken reagan is eighth cecil Eunice ninth keith wade is tenth Kerry teague has fallen back to 11th position bobby woods is being posted 12th 13th is Graham Taylor, and he started way back toward the tail end of the field, so he's had a good run here this afternoon. David Boggs is 15th, or 14th, rather, and Jimmy Horton currently round out the top 15. Yeah, Graham Taylor had to get on a provisional starting spot. He has tried to appear in Winston Cup races over the, uh, over the past, uh, primarily up north. We'll see him at Dover, at Pocono, uh, occasionally at Michigan, and he tries and has succeeded to get into the field uh, on occasion and had to use a provisional here today. As we get set to go back to green, let's check in with Winston Kelly. He has been standing near the the infield care center for the last while. Jerry Cook walked in under his own power, Eli, and one of his family members came out just a moment ago and told some of the crew members that he is okay. He may have a broken right index finger, but other than that, Jerry Cook is okay, and he's still in the infield care center. Well, that is good news about uh, the driver who was involved in the accident on lap number 20. Tore up his race car pretty well, but uh, Cook is doing uh, pretty well, as we understand now, from Winston Kelly. Forming up for the restart in front of Fred Armstrong in turn four. Well, it's two by two again. Some of the lap cars have decided to come down to the inside of the banking. Right behind the Pontiac safety car, the car is on the lead lap. Up front there is Ben Hess as they come down for the green flag. That Pontiac pace car will be going on to pit road. We'll get back under green here in just a moment. Hopefully we can race a while now because we've had about three caution flags within the last 12 or 15 laps here. Pontiac pace car hits pit road. We'll go back to full song as they come down to the line. Green flag is in the air and Ben Hess takes off. Bobby Bowser tries to hang with him. He won't be able to do it. He drops back just a little bit as they scramble for the lead down in turn one. Dorsey Schrader rides about four car lengths back in the third position. He's followed by Bobby Gearhart and Carl Biscotten. All single file to the banking of turn number one. Now Bobby Bowser looks to the inside of the race leader as they come off turn number two. No room to make a move there. There's a slower car down to the inside. The leaders will go to the high side of the racetrack trying to clear some of that lap traffic. They pulled up in the double file restart. The front three will clear that car as they come to the entrance of turn three. Still Ben Hess, Bowser, and Schrader single file. Schrader takes a look to the inside of Bowser and Bowser likewise trying to take a look to the inside of Ben Hess but they'll all stay single file. Schrader starts to fall off the pace of the leaders just a little bit as they come off turn four. One car tagged the outside retaining wall between turns three and four, but everybody continues on their way without any problem. Ben Hess is the race leader. Bobby Bowser is second. Dorsey Schrader running in third as that one car now cuts across race traffic and heads toward the pit lane. We remain under green, but it was a close call for Donnie Moran, the uh, driver who campaigns the uh, Mopar here. He is the Chrysler driver as he brings his car down to the attention of the crew on pit road. The leaders are heading up towards and Bestwick. And two-thirds of the way down to the end of the back straightaway. Right now, Ben Hess opening up about four car lengths on the Bobby Bowser machine. Bobby Bowser slides up the banking just a bit, and now Ben Hess digs his machine right down low, as does Bowser. Dorsey Trader still trying to catch up with the front two. Three cars out there in the lead draft all by themselves. It's a couple of seconds back to fourth, fifth, and sixth in single file racing here in the front straightaway. Alan Bestwick, we were talking on a commercial break just a moment ago, sitting here in the tower and looking over in your vicinity of the racetrack, going off into turn number three. We have seen an awful lot of cars go in very low. It looks like they're having a hard time keeping that car down on the racetrack. They're just shooting right up toward the outside retaining wall over there. Well, you know, we've talked a couple of times today about the transition from the banking onto the straightaway off of turn number four. And this is just the opposite of that. This is the transition from the flat straightaway into the banking of turn number three. And they're not also being helped by the fact that we've got a pretty good stiff wind blowing here from turn number one across into turn number three. And just as the car begins to turn sideways up into the the banking a good gust of wind is catching it on the left rear quarter that might not be helping some of these cars either 
front three cars continue to pull away as we work back to the stripe here on the 33rd of 80 lap. It's going to be Ben Hess, Bobby Bowser, and Dorsey Schrader. The differential from third place back to fourth place, Bobby Gerhardt, is two and a half seconds on pit road right now. What was a quick stop for uh, Doc Watson in the Del McCoward car now becomes a bit more of a lengthy stay on the pit lane. The former boxer now has his car creeping away from his pit stall and back onto the racetrack. Here at Daytona International Speedway, the ARCA 200 is three laps shy of halfway. Ben Hess leads now by some seven or eight car lengths on Bobby Bowser and Dorsey Schrader. They in turn now have some four and a half seconds on Bobby Gerhardt, who is running in tandem with the, the Jimmy Horton machine. Dale McDowell is also there in that tight pack of traffic. Mark Gibson and Tim Hepler have just taken their cars behind the wall. The attrition rate has grown here in a hurry. Farrell Harris is out for the afternoon. He was in an accident, as was Bob Brevac and Red Farmer. Rusty Johnson lost an engine. Mike Davis with a broken axle. Jerry Cook and David Sipko were in accidents. Charlie Glotzbach had an engine failure. Billy Simmons lost the gearbox. Ron Burchett had engine failure. John Stratman was in an accident, and now uh, Mark Gibson and Tim Hepler both uh, taking their cars behind the wall as the leaders come back to the strike. Well, the front three are running nose to tail, no problem there. They have a little bit of daylight between those three positions, but from fourth place on back, that is a real scramble as they head back down into turn number one. They've been swapping the lead back and forth in that pack of traffic, and I've been really surprised. Boy, they've gotten awfully close to the wall, Joe Moore, in both ends of this racetrack. Been some real close calls here coming off turn number two. That settled down just a bit. The fourth position position being held by Jimmy Horton in fifth is Dale McDowell but a good battle continues for six as Ken Reagan's trying to hold off Kerry T. Jimmy Horton has been the real show in that group of cars. He started at the back of that pack when we went back to green. Now he's leading that pack. The problem is nobody's able to keep up with him, and he's got a long way to go with no drafting help to catch the leaders. Still a good tussle between Reagan and Teague. Teague will take it right down to the bottom of the racetrack, trying to get around the Reagan machine, but Reagan will defend as he comes off four. It is halfway. The crossed flags shown by Doyle Ford to the leaders as they come by the start-finish line, and the advantage is continuing to grow. It is seven. 0.03 seconds from the front three cars back to fourth place Jimmy Horton as Horton tries to find some help as he works his way around this racetrack quick reminder to those of you here in the Daytona Beach area 11 consecutive nights of racing underway right now at Volusia County Speedway in Barberville that's about 15 miles from right here in Daytona Beach and uh, the racing in Volusia County culminates with the second annual Winston National Invitation Showdown there's $50,000 on the line February the 16th. Curtis Markham was the man who uh, showed the way there a year ago, the driver from Fredericksburg, Virginia. So if you're in the Daytona Beach area or planning on joining us here during this week upcoming, don't forget nighttime racing at Volusia County Speedway in Barberville. Another car has gone behind the wall and headed to the garage area. Dave Weltmeyer apparently is retiring his car for the day. Outstanding run going on here at Daytona in the ARCA 200 this afternoon for young driver Bobby Bowser. Now he comes from a racing background. His father, Jack, has been racing some 25 or 30 years. In fact, both of his brothers also have been in and out of race cars. I had a chance to chat with him yesterday. He had a pretty good year last year on some of the short tracks, but had just terrible uh, luck, and everything happened to him that seemed to uh, was on the super speedways. But today he's having a good run, and he talks about running Daytona. No, you're not. you got to stay up with them guys, and the tighter you keep with them, the better off you'll be. You know, you drop out of line, and you're just going to go backwards. He's talking about staying up there in the draft, and he said the first time he came to a super speedway like Atlanta or Talladega, he was just a lot apprehensive about getting up there with the air currents buffeting the car around. But apparently the way he's getting around here this afternoon, he's getting it done. He is getting it done, and so too is Dorsey Schrader, who although he has run this racetrack in the Jack Roush Mustangs over the years and the Cougars in IMSA competition, now this is a whole different animal. And the, the draft is something that Dorsey Schrader knew about. Are you comfortable? with it yet Dorsey yeah you know from my rock last year and and um, and what practices that we've done Mark Martin and I went out and drafted together quite honestly the draft for me I like you know it, it's it gets my adrenaline going running up close with somebody like that I'm not sure yet you know on our car setup what it's going to do to the car it's a little disconcerting when they move you around we went out in the IROC cars the other day and little Al and Mark Martin and I went out and I had a car that was pretty loose, and Mark got up underneath and took the window off the spoiler, and I got real crossed up, up in two. So uh, I knew I didn't like that a great deal. So uh, we're going to have a little bit tighter car than that for the race, we hope. 
Those are the thoughts of Dorsey Schrader, and his car is running awfully well right now in an impressive third-place run behind the race leader, Ben Hess. Most of these drivers have adapted pretty well to the draft, and it, the, most of them that you talk to will tell you that it takes about three races here to run in at least packs of traffic of three, four, five, six cars till you really get comfortable because running with one car, it, the car reacts one way. Running with two and three cars, it reacts another. And then when you get right in the middle of a 10 or 12 car train, uh, things change again. So it does take a pretty long time at Daytona in all kinds of situations to, to be very comfortable in that draft. The laps go on the board. 44 of the 80 in the ARCA 200 are complete here this afternoon. As they continue to wind around, Ben Hess sets the pace over in turn two. Bobby Bowser still sits in the second spot. He's about two car lengths behind the race leader and three car lengths back to third place car of Dorsey Schrader. Those three running now about half a straightaway behind the next lap. Traffic they'll encounter. Meanwhile, Jimmy Horton is another half the length of the back straightaway back off of the leaders now trying to pick up a draft from Dale McDowell. Meanwhile, also Bobby Bowser now takes his car up on the banking. Ben Hess tries to defend down low. Bowser got a real good jump on him, but now Dorsey, Dorsey Schrader will tighten it up as they come off turn number four. Looks like there's a problem with Bowser. Bowser is going to pit, and he'll follow the uh, slower car in front of him, or rather the race leader now, Ben Hess. Hess comes on to pit road. Bobby Bowser comes on to pit road. This is on lap number 46. Meanwhile, Dorsey Schrader pulls away, so Bowser and Hess are in. Let's cover their stops. Well, it doesn't seem to be a problem with Bowser's car. They're just uh, washing the windshield off, going yeah. to uh, fuel the car up. Uh, I don't think there's a problem with either one of the cars. I think they're just going to uh, take on fuel and let them go. I know they're these would be routine pit stops. Now, remember, some of the guys have pitted under these cautions a little bit earlier, but neither one of these cars, at least in, in the record keeping I'm doing here in the tower, have made a pit stop. So they've gone a little over 100 miles, and now they come in and make a pit stop and go back onto the racetrack. And we're starting to see that Jimmy Horton master plan come into focus. We had talked about him going with a V6. He said he'd like to stop early for fuel and then hopefully be able to pull away. Well, when he stopped back on lap number 22, it put him back a little bit, but now he is uh, comfortably in the lead and about to lap Dorsey Schrader, who had to come in and make a pit stop a short while ago. So at least for the moment, Barney, that, uh, that Jimmy Horton master plan is coming together. Seems to be at this juncture of the race. Let's get some more updates on some of those pit stops. Jim Phillips. Everybody with the Dorsey Schrader come by my position. Looked like he had some damage to his grill section, which is going to affect his car uh, just a little bit. Donnie Moran continues to come on pit road. He's been on about three times. What happens when you hit the wall here at Daytona? A lot of time the rear end gets knocked over in the car toward the left side. That's what happened to his car. Also, Dale McDowell has been in on pit road. He's got gasoline. He's back out now. Kerry Teague, who's having a pretty good run this afternoon, also made a pit stop there just a moment ago and has gone back on the speedway. And Bobby Gerhardt made a stop. He's had a good run here today. Very likable young driver, Gerhardt, and having a good run. Hope to have a good finish. He said if he could finish the top five, he would be happy. Kerry Teague is the uh, fellow who won that sportsman race, NASCAR's new sportsman division. He won the spring race at the Charlotte Motor Speedway a year ago. And I was talking with Kerry yesterday about uh, his first ever time on the racetrack here at Daytona. I said, you like the place? Are you comfortable? I'll tell you what's truth, Eli. Ever since we've got here, I've been comfortable with the car. Uh, we ran fast. Uh, I compare the car a lot with the sportsman car that we run over at Charlotte with the because these are restricted plate motors, and they've not got a ton of horsepower. So I felt real comfortable with it. Thoughts of driver Kerry Teague. Meanwhile, there's a car slow in front of Joe Moore, and there, there seems to be a reason why there, Joe. A little bit of, uh, well, I'll tell you what it is now. I was going to say a piece of sheet metal, but it's actually the fuel tank that's hanging out of David Boggs' car. He's dropped to the inside of the racetrack and is trying to make a way back, back around to the front. The fuel can after he was uh, on pit road for service. Evidently, the uh, can never did disengage from the uh, quick fill uh, hole on the uh, rear of the car, so he's uh, limping his way around the racetrack and he'll have the crew remove that uh, filler can as we continue under green here at Daytona. 51 laps are on the board right now. Jimmy Horton is the race leader. Here comes to the pit road, the car that Joe was telling you about moments ago, David Boggs with the uh, gas can dangling ever so precariously to the left rear of the automobile. 
the crew will jump over the wall, remove the can, and uh, Boggs will receive the appropriate penalties here from the ARCA officials before being able to return to the race. On the uh, leaderboard right now, running in second spot, is Scott Hansen, a driver from Green Bay, Wisconsin, who drives the Air Orlando Chevrolet. That's a car owned by Ken Schrader, the Winston Cup driver. Kenny Schrader had been talking to the folks at Air Orlando about some sponsorship, and they said, well, we couldn't really participate in Winston Cup racing, uh, and then Kenny said, how about ARCA? And they hooked up that way, and Ken has uh, gotten Scott Hansen into the car, and he has been running around uh, 13th or 14th much of the day. He has now moved up into second by virtue of the uh, pit stops as they fall right now. Kenny enjoys being a car owner. He spends an awful lot of time over in the ARCA garage when they run different races in conjunction with the Winston Cup teams, and he likes to go over there and, and help those guys and give them some pointers and whatever. A couple of more pit stops happening right now. Ron Keselowski is on pit road, and we're also seeing a couple other cars that were in there just a moment ago. Now, these, these would be routine pit stops. As we said, we're just past the halfway point, 53 laps complete of the 80 that make up the ARCA 200 this afternoon. They swing around here, continuing. Jimmy Horton right now has everything pretty much to his liking. As we pointed out when we first came on the air this afternoon, he had great success on just about all the super speedways that the ARCA cars went to last year. He won here at Daytona. He won at Atlanta. He won at, uh, at Pocono. And just he felt like he could come back here and just have a little bit of luck today. And so far, everything is played right into Jimmy Horton's hands. But there's still an awful lot of racing left. Let's go down to pit road. Jim Phillips. Well, Ron Keselowski, Marty, it's not a routine stop for him this time because they're pushing the Chevrolet behind the pit lane. He has some damage to the left front of his automobile, uh, the front uh, air dam on his car, but they are pushing his car all the way behind the garage, going to the garage area right now. And just a moment ago, uh, Glenn Brewer, he made a pit stop. It was a regular pit stop for him, just gasoline, and he went back onto the speedway. So Bob Keselowski's car, I called him Ron a, a moment ago, my mistake, Bob Keselowski's machine has been pushed behind the pit wall, and the attrition rate has been pretty severe here in the ARCA race. It's all happened in the last 15 or 20 laps. Keselowski has gone behind the wall. Dave Weltmeyer is out. Tim Hepler, Mark Gibson, John Straitman, who hit the wall up in turn number one. David Semko's car has retired. Ron Burchette's car is out. Jerry Cook had some problems. Charlie Glotzback has gone to the garage. Mike Davis, Rusty Johnson, Red Farmer, Bob Brevac, and Farrell Harris. A lot of the top contenders that had a shot to win here today. Exactly. A lot of guys who really were the odds-on favorites. Let's update you on the uh, medical condition of a couple of drivers. Jerry Cook, who we uh, heard from Winston Kelly, was basically doing okay in the infield care center. He does have a fractured right forefinger, but uh, he has been uh, treated and released from the infield care center with uh, just that injury. Red Farmer is complaining of bruised ribs and a tender left ankle. The x-rays that they've done here at the track did not show anything, but they have uh, taken him across the street to the Halifax Medical Center for further x-rays and a uh, check over there. But uh, that's the update on both Jerry Cook and Red Farmer. Scary piece of driving, but it comes out just fine for Cecil Eunice as he exited turn four in front of Fred Armstrong. Well, he's just coming down to the inside of the racetrack, Eli, and he got a tire down on that apron, and when you do that, it really unsettles the car. And then as he was exiting the corner, once again, it's a really weird transition, and Cecil Eunice just got sideways, and he spawned. He pretty much had no traffic around him. Anybody that was by him got on by him, so no incident there. A good piece of driving by Cecil Eunice. And the car is in one piece on pit road, and they're working on it right now, but the yellow flag is on the racetrack, and this will be the fifth one of the day. Comes out on lap 57. He's another one of those veterans we've talked about. Cecil Eunice had top 10 finishes at Pocono. He's finished in the top 10 at Michigan. He has run ninth at Talladega. So uh, he's another of those veterans who even ran some Winston, excuse me, uh, Bush Grand National races late last year. So Cecil Eunice, a super job getting that car back under control here. But we are under caution for the fifth time. Hey, from the Daytona International Speedway, this is MRN Radio. We're back at the Daytona International Speedway. 58 laps are now completed. The 80 that will make up the ARCA 200. We're working caution for the fifth time when Cecil Eunice had problems coming off turn number four and spun the car some uh, thousand feet or better, kept it in a good straight line, didn't hit anything, made a pit stop, and will be able to continue this race. We can take you back through the running order. We haven't had one from uh, scoring in the last 15 or 20 laps, but just before this round of pit stops, uh, why don't we run you through the field a little bit and tell you where some of your favorite drivers might be running. Ben Hess was leading at about lap 45. Bobby Boucher was riding second. Dorsey Schroeder, Schrader was running third. Fourth, Jimmy Horton. Dale McDowell was fifth. 
Ken Reagan was six. He's had a pretty steady run here today. Kerry Teague was being posted seventh at that time. Carl Miss Cotton was eighth. Bobby Gerhardt ninth. Cecil Eunice, who spun just a moment ago to put us under caution, was tenth. The 11th position, Bob Keselowski, that has changed because he has gone behind the wall with his car, so that would drop him out of the running order and move Scott Hansen up into the 11th position. Keith Wade would be posted 12th, 13th, Bobby Woods, Graham Taylor 14th, and 15th, Joe Nimrowski in the 16th position, Patty Simcoe Schacht, 17th, David Boggs, 18th, Roy Payne, and 19th, Jerry Hill. That would be the way they'd been running uh, some 10 or 12 laps ago, and that hasn't changed a whole lot. You know, there are a lot of uh, car owners who you respect in the garage area, fellows who've been around a long, long time, fellows who have won championships. Jack Roush, obviously one of those. Jack has won some 22 championships in different forms of racing over the years, and he is particularly high on Dorsey Schrader, the young driver who qualified on the pole here, and will be doing some racing in Bush Series and Winston Cup competition for Jack this year, and I, I told Dorsey, I said, Jack Roush is awfully high on your ability. There's no question about I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jack. You know, uh, when he started looking at a second Winston Cup car, I told him I'd really like a, a shot at uh, getting an opportunity to drive that car. And I really don't think that would have ever matured had not I gone to the IROC series last year, got down there in Talladega and started bump drafting with Mark Martin and mixing it up with those guys. And Mark, you know, they all laughed at it. They said, but I guess he might be OK. So uh, Jack has helped me. He put me on with Lucky Compton. He's got uh, the Valvoline and Napa situation. He's helped us get that put together. So, you know, we're really looking uh, toward 1992 as a full Winston Cup uh, effort, hopefully. Interesting, though. Dorsey is 37 years old. Not that that's old because I'm 37 and I'm uh, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly not old, but uh, Dorsey, oh, yeah. <laughs> but Dorsey said it is a now or never opportunity for him, and he's uh, going to make the best of it. Let's check in with Winston Kelly in the garage. We've been standing with Mark Gibson, who will not repeat his last year's run. Had an outstanding run last year, finished second. What happened today, Mark? Must have run over some debris and knocked the oil pump belt off. He, it, the motor will still run, but we can't take a chance on blowing. He don't know what kind of damage is already done. So that's that's the way racing is. So Daytona Beach native Mark Gibson is out this afternoon. Also standing alongside us is Bob Keselowski, who also just went out of the race. Bob, what happened to your car? Well, apparently uh, the screens got plugged up on a grill and uh, with papers and debris, and uh, we overheated it. And I, it was running hot. I backed out of the draft a little bit to try to cool it. We were running as high as six here one time, but uh, I backed it down out of the draft, and it still wouldn't come down. And finally, we come in to make our normal pit stop, and they cleaned the grill, but it was too late. It, uh, when I left the pits, it was smoking, and uh, apparently we burned a piston or something. So 15 of the 42 cars out of this afternoon's ARCA 200. We'd also like to report that John Straitman, who was involved in an earlier caution, also went to the infield care center, walked under his own power. He has not come out yet, but he is okay. And that's good news. Field forming up for a double file restart out of turn number four, and they ought to be some real racing at the front of the pack, at least for several laps here as we're getting on down toward the tail end of this thing in the ARCA 200. Just 20 laps remain. The leader is Jimmy Horton. Right behind him, a very aggressive young driver and has the equipment to get it done and pull off a win here this afternoon, Ben Hess. Riding third right now is Bobby Bauscher. Kerry Teague, the rookie driver, is fourth as they put him under green and haul it down the front straightaway. Little jockeying three wide back in the pack as different drivers try to get position up in front of Joe Moore in turn one. Jimmy Horton jumps out by three car lengths now over Ben Hess. Further back, a couple of cars shuffling around. The Bobby Bauscher car, he's trapped back behind two slower cars. He'll work to the inside of one of those. That's a Ken Reagan machine. Now Bowser pulls up on the Dorsey Schrader car in turn two. Schrader having lost a lap on his green flag pit stop a while ago falls back quite a good distance off the lead two. Here comes Bowser down to the inside now trying desperately not to lose contact with Horton and Ben Hess as they enter turn three. Bowser will complete the pass as he hits turn three. Reagan will go along with it but meanwhile it's uh, the front two have been able to skitter away as Ben Hess comes off the corner right behind him a charging Bobby Bowser. Bobby Bowser trying to close in from about a dozen car lanes back, but at the point right now, Jimmy Horton and Ben Hess, those two cars tied tightly together. Hess draws to within a half car lane to the race lead here in the ARCA 200. They're back in turn one. Hess will try to make his move to the outside around Jimmy Horton in turn one. That's not going to work. Both cars take this identical line through turn number two, still enjoying about a five car length lead over the third place car of Bobby Bowser. A couple of Chevrolets at the head of the field now as they come back down to the back straightaway. They've got 
a good 10 car lengths over the Bobby Bauscher car, although Bauscher is beginning to reel that distance in now as they reach the end of the stretch. Jimmy Horton takes it right down to the bottom of the racetrack. Ben Hess will follow him. Now Horton drifts up the banking just a bit. Hess trying to take advantage of that situation to look down to the inside as they come off four. Ben Hess trying to work around and get underneath Jimmy Horton. He won't be able to do it. Horton is a good super speedway driver. We watched him all last year when he ran different racetracks. He's very smooth and a very heads-up race driver. I'm kind of surprised that somebody didn't tap him to drive a Winston Cup car this year as he leads the ARCA 200 here at Daytona with 63 laps complete. Some pretty good competition. Uh, in the ARCA race right now, three cars are locked up in a tussle for the lead, and a little further back, the rest of the field kind of scrambling for what's left as the front three work out of turn number four and come back down to the line. They're chasing Jimmy Horton, who has been just unbelievable on super speedways all the year 1990 and wants to start out 1991 as a winner. Ben Hess right behind him and Bobby Bowser beginning to get a little itchy, Joe Moore, like he wants to take the lead away from the front two up there. Boy, Bowser has done a good job after the restart. He had found himself trapped back behind traffic and had to work his way to catch up with the front two. He is now there and it's a three-car breakaway here as they go around slower in traffic in turn two. Clean racetrack ahead as they come down the back straightaway still running bumper to bumper is Horton and Hess then about three car lengths back Back to the Bobby Bowser car. They'll approach the slowing car of Rusty Johnson on the apron of turn three. Horton takes it right down to the bottom of the racetrack as the traffic begins to become a factor. Horton will drift up the banking a bit, just about to the same place in the apex of the corner. He always does. Hess took a quick peek to the inside, but no room to make the move. Jimmy Horton still leads through the trioval area, back to the start-finish line. Lap 68 goes up on the board, a dozen remaining. Barney and I were just talking up here in the booth about Jimmy Horton and why it is he doesn't have a Winston Cup ride. He only he said to us this morning he had only one team talk to him about a serious Winston Cup opportunity for this 1991 season. And that was a, a team that is only a part-time campaigner at best. And they said to Jimmy, if you are ready to test our cars, and that's all fine and dandy. But if somebody shows up with a sponsor, even if it's the day before the Daytona 500, you're out and he's in. And uh, not to mention the car owner in question, but suffice to say, Jimmy weighed his options and said there really isn't a whole heck of a lot of opportunity there. He said, I could be out at any time without any warning, and he decides to stay put where he is. But he's got his hands full now. Ben Hess trying to make a run at Horton for the lead. He looks to the inside in the trioval area, but Horton takes that spot away with 10 laps to go as they head back into turn number one. They'll swing around the slower car of Donnie Moran, climbing the banking of turn number one. Horton leads by two car lengths. Now here comes Hess again. He dives to the inside, pulls up alongside Horton off turn two. The black car of Ben Hess on the inside, the white car of Jimmy Horton on the outside. It's a drag race down to the end of the back straightaway. Bobby Bosher still sits three car lengths back. Dead even at the end of the straightaway. Now Horton noses out in front just a tick in turn three. But Ben Hess will battle back to the low side of the racetrack. Horton unable to stick down low, so Horton will drift up the banking. Ben Hess grabs the lead of the ARCA 200. Time to make a move here in the ARCA 200. Apparently he feels that the young driver, Ben Hess, has put himself out front right now. Horton settles back into the second spot. Bobby Bowser tried to put a move on him at the start-finish line to scoot in there and take over the number two position. He couldn't do it. Takes another look down in turn one. Those front three cars have to go single file to the outside, getting around one of the slower cars. Again, it's Hess leading the way. Horton has the second spot. Two car links back to Bobby Bowser. Single file. They make their way off turn two. And crank it up one more time. Down Daytona's long back straightaway. A good distance ahead before they encounter any more lap traffic. Still Ben Hess, Jimmy Horton, bumper to bumper. Then four car links back to Bobby Bowser. Sure. Horton able to cut that down to about one car length, but Ben Hess is able to take his machine right down to the bottom of the racetrack. And again, Jimmy Horton slides up the banking, and now Bobby Bowser comes in to battle for second. Bowser trying to look to the inside. He is there alongside Jimmy Horton. They are trailing the race leader, Ben Hess, by about three and a half car lengths at the stripe. Second place is still Horton's, but now as Jimmy swings to the outside, retaining wall, going to turn number one, Bowser makes his move to the inside. Bowser is there right alongside Jimmy Horton this the second place battle through turn one on to turn number two. Still dead even the battle for the second spot. Neither one giving a bit as Hess still leads the way. And they begin to approach some lap traffic as Chris Gerke's car moves down to the low groove on the back straightaway. Horton moves Bowser down low to try and use that lap car as a pick and it will work as he enters turn number three. Bowser has to back off. Horton takes it up to the middle of the racetrack as does Bowser. Ben Hess in the meantime has been able to scoot away from both of those cars. He's got about five car lengths as they come off four. And that door-to-door -door racing allowed Ben Hess to get away a little bit. Now, Bowser said yesterday he thought he could win this thing. I think so. You know, I really do. 
Yeah, I take in a lot of lot of moves that Charlie does. I had a lot of time to you know look things over last year, but I think the car is going to be pretty strong. You know, if everything holds together and we don't have no flats, we'll be in good shape. He's in good shape right now. They're back to turn two. Sitting in the third spot is Bobby Bowser. He's about two car lengths behind the second place car of Jimmy Horton. And they run with a clean racetrack ahead again as they come down the back straightaway. The next lap traffic almost half a mile ahead of them now. Horton moves right up on Ben Hess's back bumper as they hit the banking. Horton takes it down to the bottom of the racetrack, but Ben Hess digs in down low. He'll defend that inside line. Now Bobby Bowser will catch up. They're just about equal distance apart as they come off turn number four. They come back towards the stripe. They'll complete lap number 72 this time. Ben Hess, who won this event back in 1989 and then backed it up with the win at Atlanta, now sees Jimmy Horton challenge for the lead. Horton draws inside of Hess to turn one. And goes by. Horton does in turn number one, taking the inside line. Hess will have none of that. He comes back. Ben Hess down to the inside of Jimmy Horton. The lead battle off turn two. Side by side. Ben Hess to the inside. Jimmy Horton to the outside as one car goes up and smoke and now spins on the back straight away. One car off the racetrack. Mark Thompson spins around backwards into the infield grass. He'll not hit anything. He straightens the car out as the lead battle rages on in turn three. Down low is Ben Hess, just a nose advantage as Jimmy Horton goes up the banking, but now Bobby Boucher takes advantage and he'll battle it out with Horton as well. They're going to race back to the finish line because caution is on the speedway. Here they come and there's a lap car directly in front. They may stack them three wide and Horton is going to come across in the number one spot. Ben Hess will come across in the number two spot and Bobby Boucher as this caution comes out puts him back to third. 70 Four laps are complete in the ARCA 200 here. We may have a great finish in this one yet. Let's get an update from Alan Bestwick. How uh, serious a uh, repair job or anything have they got to do on the Mark Thompson car, Alan? Not much at all, Eli. What happened was as Thompson's car was coming down the back straightaway, the motor was obviously seizing up on him. He was already off the throttle, and he was already on the apron of the racetrack when the thing finally let go and the oil got down underneath his tires. So he spun immediately off the racing surface into the grass, spun about a 1,000 feet or so, never hit anything inside or out, and the car just sits in the infield Grass now already uh, with a wrecker pulling up to it. There should be little or no problem with the racing surface on the back straightaway, although they will go out and check it. So we should be able to get back to green to finish this. It'll be five to go the next time the field comes by the start finish line. They'll get that indication from Doyle Ford. If you want to see more of this kind of racing, it's turned out to be a super run for the finish here for the ARCA Permatech Series. Don't forget, next stop is the Atlanta Motor Speedway on the 16th of March. That's part of the Winston Cup weekend at uh, Atlanta. Then on April the 28th, the Kill Care Speedway in Xenia, Ohio. They run 125 laps there. The Talladega Super Speedway hosts the ARCA Series on May the 4th. On May 25th, it's Flat Rock Speedway in Michigan. And the next day, May 25th, 26 Toledo, Ohio, hosting the ARCA series. In June, June 7th, it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. June 15th, Pocono International Raceway for 150 miles. June 22nd, Michigan International Speedway. And the month of June wraps up June 28th at Kill Care Speedway in Xenia, Ohio. And June 29th, Flat Rock Speedway in Michigan. That's where the ARCA series will run their first half of the schedule. And it's going to be a dandy season the way things are shaping up right here for this ARCA series. I tell you, they have a tough series because they go to little short tracks, little bull rings all over the country, much like NASCAR did some 20 or 25 years ago. They run a and couple of dirt races. Yeah, and then they come to the Super Speedway. So we're talking to some of the different ARCA drivers here, and they say, you know, our schedule is like a... Well, like Alabama, you know, playing some of the tougher teams, but then they play some easy ones exactly. and then play some tough ones, pretty much like college ball or anything else. But they're very versatile race drivers, and most of them... Uh, as we pointed out, have done a great job here today. I've been very impressed with the way they contain themselves and, and the accidents that we've seen without locking the cars down. That We've seen that a lot in the past, but I think the experience is beginning to pay off for the ARCA teams. We are under caution with some five laps remaining in the ARCA 200. Now, apparently, they will be able to get this racetrack back under green. Alan Bestwick still look good over there. Yeah, cleanup truck has already made one pass, Barney. They're going back just to double-check the safety apron on the inside of the back stretch again. The wrecker is hooked up to Thompson's car and is now pulling it back behind the wall here on the back straightaway. Thompson climbed out of the car and got into the ambulance. They'll take that back through the infield for the mandatory trip to the care center as well. I don't know who I'd pick of the front three that's up there right now because they've all at a, at a given point in this race today displayed an awful lot of muscle and, a, and the car has been working well through both ends of the racetrack. Could be either one of them. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be these three now because the field's going to be able to close up right behind them. I think uh, the 
the best guess might have to be either Horton or Hess because they have both won on super speedways, whereas Bobby Bowser is not. Kerry Teague is maybe doing the, the most surprising job of any. Here's a guy who's at Daytona for the very first time out of NASCAR Sportsman Division. And I, when I talked to him about it the other day, I said, uh, you almost sound like you're overconfident, Kerry. No, I tell you, it's, it's just the difference between... Uh I've been racing for about seven years, and this is the first year I guess I really reached out to get me uh, a crew chief that knows what's going on with these cars. And Dick's making my job easy for me, believe it or not. I mean, he's making me look good. The car is really driving. It's like a Cadillac. I mean, I just sit in and turn the wheel, and it goes. That's Kerry Teague. He's running in third right now. Scott Hansen, who drives Kenny Schrader's car, is in fourth. Roy Payne from Hueytown, Alabama, going for Rookie of the Year honors this year in ARCA. He is running in sixth, ahead of Joan Nimrosky in seventh, and Patty Simcoe Schacht, who, as you mentioned at the outset of the show, Barney, is uh, back after taking a year off with the birth of uh, Priscilla Ann Schacht, and uh, Patty Simcoe having a, a super run here today as the field gets the one-to-go signal. One more lap, and they will go back to green to conclude the ARCA 200 here at Daytona. As you pointed out, a lot of action left in Speed Weeks in 1991 here with a, the Gatorade Twin 125 qualifying races coming up on Thursday afternoon. To me, those have always been two of the best shows at Daytona. I'll, I probably get as pumped up to watch those two shows as I do the Daytona 500. 45 minutes of flat-out racing each time by. It's, it's tough to miss on those. Uh, Davey Allison, of course, having already won the pole for the Daytona 500 by STP. He and Ernie Irvin will be uh, running in the Twin 125, sponsored by Gatorade here on Thursday, and it's uh, a critical race, obviously. That's how you establish the starting lineup for next Sunday's Daytona 500 by STP. That will be Thursday at 12 noon Eastern Time, our broadcast coverage. Then we're on the air next Saturday with the season opener for the Bush Grand National Cars, the Goodies 300, again 12 noon, and then one week from today, the Daytona 500 by STP, also 12 noon Eastern Time. But right now, we're down to the final three and a half laps to settle this arc of 200. Field in the middle of the back stretch with a Pontiac pace car at the head of the field as they move up to Alan Bestwick. Alan, you've been out there and had a chance to watch how those cars are handling and working in the corner of the front three up there. Who's got the best shot? Well, I think they're all pretty well even, Barney. Twice we've seen Horton pass Hess and Hess pass Horton on the back straightaway here, and both times it's been a real drag race in a dogfight. I think really what it's going to come down to is who gets underneath and gets the bottom groove in turn three on that last lap. I think that's who's going to have the upper hand. Field is moving over to Fred Armstrong. Well, you know, Ben Hess has been able to uh, outmaneuver Horton uh, for the, about the last 10 or 15 laps here in turn four, so that may be the key. Hess is able to put his car right down to the bottom of the racetrack, as is Bowser. Horton having a little trouble sticking down low, so it's going to get awful interesting down here as we wind down to the final laps. Well, Jimmy Horton has had more success on the super speedways than young Ben Hess, but I doubt if there's a driver out there anymore right now pumped up to win than Ben Hess would be or Bobby Bowser. We're about to find out. Pace car is on pit road, double file. Restart as they come down, the green flag is in the air and they stack them three wide and Horton gets lost in the shuffle and Carl Miscotton gets slammed into the wall just T-boned in there and cars are going everywhere. There's going to be at least four five, maybe six cars with severe sheet metal damage. Eli? When Jimmy Horton didn't come up to speed, that brought about one problem. Then Bobby Gerhardt tried to avoid Carl Miscotton and seemed to tag him totally inadvertently in the rear. That turned Miscotton into the wall. Now those cars were still going slowly enough that although there is damage to those machines. It does not seem to be uh, severe, but it does put out the caution, and we could be looking at the race for the lead and the win right here. The field is in turn three. Down to the bottom of the racetrack goes Bobby Bowser. Now Teague tried to make a move, but Ben Hess has pulled out to about two car lengths. Teague once again tries to pass Bowser for second as they head down to the stripe. They head towards the stripe. The caution flag is flying. Ben Hess leads. Bowser second. Kerry Teague third. Jimmy Horton will move up to fourth spot. There was another car there, but showing a lap down was Dale McDowell on our last rundown. So Jimmy Horton does take fourth after not able to come up to speed on the restart. Now, that certainly would not uh, 
necessarily indicate the finish, but it's darn close, Barney, because that was lap 78, and they will get the white flag here this next time by. So that was for the win right there. Ben Hess will pick up the victory under caution. For all practical purposes, it will be. We have, we'll see quite a bit of debris and sheet metal all over the racetrack as those cars slammed in the wall. Carl Miss Cotton really got tagged into that outside wall, did a lot of sheet metal damage to his car, and we see some big chunks of debris laying down on the apron of the racetrack, and we are under caution. This will be the seventh one of the day in the ARCA 200 here this Barney, afternoon. And what a tough break for some of those guys. Dick? Barney, kind of interesting thing. Billy Horton's car, uh, Horton's car just uh, uh, run out of gas. They, they uh, said it would do good on a flat, but up in a turn like that, when you get away up on a bank like that, if you've got your uh, pickup in the center of the tank, then all the fuel's over to one side, and they ran about three or four laps real slow that way, or a couple laps real slow that way. And when he got ready to go, it just didn't have enough fuel to go. And then when it finally flattened out, well, he picked it up and away he went. But uh, that's something. They were cutting it pretty close. So. Uh, Jimmy did stop on lap 22 uh, and, and took on. Uh, that would still be way over 100 way miles. Way early, yeah, way over 100 miles. And I guess he felt he could stretch it from that point, but just uh, couldn't quite do it. Well, they said he could do it. Uh, when I talked to him earlier, they said they didn't have to stop and they could make it all the way. And they're going to make it all the way, all right. They just can't run up to speed in a bank like that. So the white and the caution for Ben Hess with Bobby Bowser second, Kerry Teague third. Ben Hess, who first appeared in ARCA back in 1987, won this race in 1989, came back with a win at the very next race in Atlanta, and he has been a tough man to handle since then. A year ago, he won the pole at Michigan for the ARCA series. He finished at third place at Talladega, so Ben Hess of Mooresville, North Carolina, will pick up his second ARCA 200 win here at Daytona this afternoon. And what a finish and what a race. And that will just about conclude it here. 79 laps are on the board, but they will finish this race under caution. Again, young Ben Hess pulling out the victory as he will get it with the yellow flag. We're kind of sitting here, and I guess we're all racing fans. We kind of said that's too bad. Not that Ben Hess won. I'm, we're saying it's too bad it didn't end under uh, green because that was going to be uh, one whale of a finish because uh, Bowser's car was, was there. Jimmy Horton may not have been a factor, as it turned out, because of uh, the fuel pickup. Uh, but uh, Kerry Teague was there as well, and it would have been a, a, an outstanding finish. But Ben Hess takes it under caution, and it will show up in the W column any way you cut it. So Ben Hess will win the race. Bobby Boucher will finish second. Kerry Teague, as you pointed out, uh, he's going to be pumped higher than a kite oh, yeah. tonight. Coming up with a third-place finish, first time here at Daytona. Jimmy Horton will be credited with a fourth-place run. Joe Nimrowski will finish fifth, sixth, Roy Payne, and unofficially Scott Hansen round out the top seven. And that's all we have from timing and scoring right now with the ARCA officials. Kind of reminds you of when Glenn Sears won this race a few years ago, the youngster from Apex, North Carolina, who had a dirt track engine in the car and said when you close the hood, the engine doesn't know where it is. And uh, that was his visit to Daytona. In this case, Kerry Teague will finish third but with a super run. And here are the checkered and caution flags together for Ben Hess, the Ohio driver who's moved to North Carolina. He'll get the win over Bobby Bowser, who has run uh, certainly one of the races of his career here at the World Center of racing this afternoon. And to update you on Carl Miss Cotton's car, it has gone to pit road. He is out of the machine and it will not be on the racetrack at the finish here after getting quite a bit of damage, getting shoved into the wall on that restart just a moment ago. Some of the ARCA teams already assembling down at the Unical gas pumps. Let's go down and see if we can get a comment from one of the top finishers. Bobby Bowser is still sitting in his Ford. Bobby had a great run out there today, just not quite enough to get around Ben. No, it wasn't quite enough. I tell you, I was trying there at the end. You know, I want this thing so bad. After last year running up in the front and had a flat tire, you know, I wanted this one bad, and I was trying my hardest. Bobby, how about that restart when Jimmy Horton didn't get up to speed and then the last lap? That was mighty exciting. Well, you know, they slowed up, and I hit Ben just a little bit, and I, I thought, well, I was going to get underneath there and go on, but it didn't work out, and then uh, had a little vibration there on that last lap. I thought maybe it had a right front flat, but I held in there. Bobby Bowser brings his Ford home in second this afternoon. A good run for him. He did have a very good run, and I think maybe his luck on super speedways will be changing in 1991. And this is only his third full year of racing. He had a couple of wins on short tracks last year. The name Bowser's been around forever, as you mentioned earlier, because of his dad. But this is Bobby's third full year, so he's uh, awfully close to winning here at Daytona. Meanwhile, in victory lane, Ben Hess is visiting that hallowed piece of property for the second time in his career. Let's go down to victory lane. 
26-year-old Ben Hess, uh, Ohio native, now lives in Mooresville, North Carolina. Ben, in 1989, you pulled it off, and again today, you're the winner of the ARCA 200. Congratulations. Well, I tell you, you talk about a hill to climb. We had to climb a hill. We didn't rent this car till last Sunday. Didn't see it till Sunday morning. It didn't have nothing off it. I want to thank some people at the 37 car, the Target people. They let us use this thing. My crew, Lee Leslie, Scott Simpson, Butch, Carl, Steve, all them guys. Hank Jones with Sports Image, Salem National Lease, Related Ventures. I tell you, I just can't stop naming. Goodyear Tire, they gave me a heck of a radio tire. I just couldn't ask for a better car. And I tell you what, I think my crew did a hell of a job for not seeing this car two days prior before we got here. This really has to make you feel good, too, in the fact that, uh, well, one thing, you've got a flat tire on the left rear there. And another thing, you've been flipping back from division to division the last couple of years. And to win this uh, race here at Daytona has to make you feel mighty proud. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of people out there. They gave me a heck of a hill to climb, and I've got to go take care of some problems, but hopefully we'll get back down here this year and get going good. And, you know, we got a left rear flat, and I picked up a vibration about 20 laps to go. These radio tires are a little hard to tell, but I tell you, the crew just kept telling me to keep on digging, and I just kept digging. And this wins for them and everybody over there in Desert Storm. You had a couple of uh, close calls there at the start-finish line. Uh, tell us about the first one there when uh, you came up on a slower car right behind Jimmy Horton. Yeah, it got a little tight there. Uh, the lap car was as low as he could get and just ran out of room. Jimmy didn't do nothing I wouldn't have done. And then on that second restart, I don't know what happened. Jimmy just didn't go, and I slowed, and Bowser got into me. I hate that happened, but uh, like I said, Horton slowed in front of me and didn't, caught me by surprise, and I'm just glad to be here. Ben Hess, the winner of the ARCA 200 here at Daytona. Good hard run for Ben Hess. Pays off with a win of the ARCA 200 this afternoon. Let's go back down to the gas pumps and see if we can catch a couple of more top finishers. Well, I got Jimmy Horton here. Jimmy's, uh, well, you know, what can you say? Everybody knew you was here anyway. Uh, it looked good on paper what we were going to do, and it worked. You know, we had what we wanted to do down. We were leading the race, and, you know, I felt like we had the fastest car. We, we loosened it up a little bit, and Ben and them started jumping around behind me, and the car just started moving around. You know, I felt the last three laps, if we, we ran out of gas on the bank, and if I could have got to the flat and kept some gas in the motor, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have got us. You know, we, we had a good restart jump on them. You know, the car was good. The crew did a good job. I, you know, I just called the shot of gas into, you know, a couple laps too early. Maybe next time, right? Well, the thing worked all right, though. If you hadn't have, uh, hadn't been for the caution, you'd have been all right? Oh, yeah, we'd have been all right because it kept momentum up and kept the gas on that side of the tank. You know, Jim Ruggles did a fine job with a V6. We're the, you know, one of two V6s out there. We qualified it outside the road and run up front all day. Miles Concrete's behind us. Who's your tire? And Davis Distributors, you know, they just keep plugging away. and just, we, We're going to make it in Winston Cup one day. You watch. Well, I'm sure you will. Good luck to you. Thanks. Thoughts of Jimmy Horton, certainly a uh, deserving man for a Winston Cup ride if one materializes. Then there's another fellow who, after winning the sportsman race at Charlotte, last spring shows up here and says let's give it a try and he comes home with a third place finish in the arc of 200 winston kelly is with kerry teague first time ever here at daytona kerry teague out of concord north carolina outstanding run well i'll tell you what i owe a lot of a lot of gratitude to red dog to red dog and and uh, mickey gibbs my crew chief they all done a good job red dog the man he's talking about buddy barnes who works for the mickey gibbs team Kerry, your impressions of Daytona the first time here? I love it. I, I can't wait to come back. Uh, these guys, they they, told, they kind of walked me through it, told me to stay out of trouble and just draft with somebody. And I was, I was hollering, she's driving like a Cadillac. Let's go. How about those last few laps when Jimmy Horton didn't come up to speed? It got awful exciting out there. Yeah, Jimmy didn't come up to speed, and everybody started ducking to the outside. And uh, the car behind me running in the back of me, he got all squirrely. And uh, everybody was on the radio hollering, just go as hard as I could. And we ran down the corner behind the 21. He got loose, and I tried to get by him and just couldn't do it. How about the plans for the rest of the 1991 season? I don't know. We're going to walk right over here to the garage here, and me and my guys, we're going to start talking for the next race. We'll see. I tell you, there can't be anybody here as happy as Kerry Teague. Maybe Ben Hess, but Kerry Teague comes to Daytona first time ever and finishes in third. We look to hear a lot from this name throughout 1991 and in the future. Boy, seems to have an awful lot of driving talent to come here and adapt to Daytona the way he did today. We may see him full-time in one of these rides, or at least a Bush Grand National car, in the coming year. 
Let's take a look at the finish that what we have from timing and scoring here. Ben Hess, the winner. Bobby Bowser will finish second. Kerry Teague runs third. Jimmy Horton, fourth. Joe Nimrosky finishes fifth. Six to Roy Payne. Scott Hansen, seventh. Ken Reagan, eighth. Keith Wade, credited with a ninth place finish. Dorsey Schrader finishes tenth. Eleventh to Bob Dodder. Twelfth goes to Bobby Gerhardt. Dale McDowell will finish thirteenth. Fourteenth, Glenn Brewer. And fifteenth, Bobby Woods. Sixteenth, Bill Venturini. Uh, Doc Watson will finish in seventeenth position. And Graham Taylor, who started last and was up as high as second and third a couple of times, is credited with an 18th place finish. Cecil Eunice, 19th, and Patty Simcoe Shack on making her return to ARCA Racing. Not a bad run for her. Finishes 20th. She does finish 20th. 21st will be Chris Gerke. David Boggs, 22nd. 23rd is Carl Miscotton. Billy Thomas finishes 24th. Finishing in the 25th spot is Mark Thompson. 26th is Donnie Moran. Tim Hepler finishes 27th. 28th, Jerry Hill. 29th is Bob Keselowski. And 30th is Rusty Johnson. 31st looks like uh, Mark Gibson. 32nd, Dave Weltmeyer. Billy Simmons finishes 33rd. John Straitman finishes 34th. David Simcoe, 35th. Ron Burchett finishes 36th. Jerry Cook, 37th. Charlie Glotzback, 38th. Mike Davis, 39th. Bob Brevac, the ARCA champion for 1990, finishes 40th. Farrell Harris, 41st. And Red Farmer, who had one of the accidents real early, goes out and finishes 42nd. So that's the rundown. We have it unofficially from timing and scoring. And our next race broadcast will be on Thursday at 12 noon Eastern time with our coverage of the Gatorade Twin 125s. And tell you something, by virtue of yesterday's qualifying, Barney, uh, granted only three fellows were at 195 or better, but everybody else is bunched at either 194 or 193, and the qualifying to get into the Daytona 500, which we see here on Thursday, is going to be something to watch. Yeah, quickly before we leave the air, in case you didn't hear about the qualifying yesterday, Davey Allison picked up the pole for the Daytona 500 by STP. Ernie Irvin qualifies outside front row, and those are the only two spots now that are locked in. Definitely know exactly where they'll start in the Daytona 500. Everyone else will get their starting spots from how they qualify in the Gatorade Twin 125s on Thursday. Harry Gant had third best speed yesterday, however. Sterling Marlin fourth, Rick Mass fifth, Dale Earnhardt sixth, Ricky Rudd seventh, eighth was Ken Schrader, Mark Martin ninth, and Alan Kowicki rounded out the fastest top ten speeds in qualifying. But from there on back, uh, well, uh, actually, it's close, as you said, only three cars at the 195, but everybody else very close together right on up through the field. It's going to be great to see. Of course, if you were not with us earlier today, three teams that had planned to use their Bush Clash car in the Daytona 500 by STP had those cars involved in accidents during the Clash, so they will have to go to backup cars. Only uh, Derek Cope who had a specific car for the clash and lost it in the race today uh, will be able to go to a planned second car for the rest of the week. So that's another story built in to Speed Weeks 1991. Our next broadcast will be Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock Eastern time. We've got NASCAR Live for you. Richard Petty will be along, as will Harry Melling, car owner for Bill Elliott's Ford. And then Thursday afternoon, 12 noon Eastern time, the Gatorade Twin 125s. We want to thank Joe Moore, Alan Bestwick, and and Fred Armstrong, who covered the action of the turns today. Our pit coverage was from Dick Brooks, Jim Phillips, and Winston Kelly. Martha Oliver and Augusta Johnson are back on the scoring loop here in 1991. Great to have them with us again. Our production assistants are Ted Stone and Ed LaRue. For Barney Hall, I'm Eli Gold. We thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Again, our congratulations to Dale Earnhardt, winner of the Bush Clash. Ben Hess, the winner of the ARCA 200. And until Tuesday evening at 7 when we talk to you next with NASCAR Live for all of us here at Daytona Beach, Florida. So long, everybody. MRN Radio. Coverage of the ARCA Permatech Series has come to you from Daytona International Speedway. The executive producer of MRN Radio is John McMullen. Associate producer, Alan Bestwick. Engineers, Harry Howard and Clay Stalka. Affiliate relations, Pat Hensley and David Hyatt. Production assistants, Tina Marr, Cheryl Knight and Stephanie Ellis. This is Rick Lewis. This broadcast was a production of MRN Radio, a division of International Speedway Corporation.